Friends, I congratulate you. We've got to the content. The Kanten Monastery is primarily known for being the founder of all modern Tibetan Buddhism. All of the Dalai Lamas came from here. In principle, this monastery is 600 years old. If you look at the history of Buddhism, just think about it. About two and a half thousand years ago, Shakyamuni Buddha came to Nepal and India and was engaged in certain activities. So he disseminated knowledge that was relevant for the society of that level of development. After that, two thousand years passed. Of course, Buddhism, which was brought to Tibet, has changed a lot. There is an unofficial version explaining why content appeared. Now I'll try to tell you about it. Unfortunately, again, I have to touch upon the topics which we discussed in some year. Sometimes not the most presentable techniques are used in practice. And almost after 2000 years, when the Buddha left this world about 600 years ago, in Tibet, Buddhism mainly remained in a broad sense when people ate meat, drank alcohol, and were engaged in all the things which the population likes. But the essence, the spirit of the Buddhist teaching as such, almost disappeared. So, according to one version, Manjushri decided to make some adjustments. How? He sent his emanation, whom most of the Tibetans found as Sankapa after a number of years. But before he became Sankapa, he had been an ordinary man. Yes, he was an outstanding person, but he was a lama who studied a lot. But as most lamas, he did certain things that were accepted in the society of that period. But Manjushri wanted him to become an evolutionary. Please note, not a revolutionary, but an evolutionary evolutionary, and he couldn't find the way to the consciousness of Sankapa anyhow. So, Sankapa, even during practice, couldn't come into contact with Manjushri. Think about it, what a problem. Manjushri sends his emanation, the emanation acquires human consciousness to such extent, so that Manjushri can't break through it to him. What did Manjushri do? He found a shepherd in some distant province of Tibet. He was just a shepherd. He wasn't enlightened. He wasn't learned. He just tended sheep. But due to the fact that he had developed a concentration, concentrating on the pasture, so that the sheep wouldn't run away, he had strong, purposeful work of his mind. So, due to this strong and purposeful work of his mind, Manjushri was able to break through to the consciousness of the shepherd, entered into a certain mental dialogue with him and said, Listen to me. Somewhere out there is a lama. His name is Sankapa. Please, go to him to talk. The shepherd said, Oh, come on, he is lama. Nobody will listen to me, nobody will allow me to come to him. He answered, come on, just come to him. The shepherd tried to refuse as he could. I think that it took a lot of effort for Manjushri to send the shepherd to the Lama. In the end, the shepherd came to Sankapa and said, Lama, forgive me, but now I hear voices in my ears and they ask me to talk to you. Or rather, it happened not like this. He wasn't allowed to come to Sankapa for a long time time, because there were the disciples already near Tsinkapa at that time, and the shepherd couldn't get through anyhow. But nevertheless, ultimately, they met, and when the shepherd told him what he heard in his head, Tsinkapa, I don't remember exactly for how long, either for half a year or even more, stayed with this shepherd alone and said, not allow anyone to get to us, we will talk with the shepherd. The shepherd told him some sacred things which Sankapa couldn't read about in any treatises, and he realized a certain essence which in principle he was trying to realize in his life. And uh, it is uh, this shepherd who had no education, he was almost the spark that created the revival of Buddhism in Tibet about 600 years ago. 
Tsunkapa had an incredible life story. Once the President Dalai Lama said such a thing. Generally, it is surprising what a man he was. Because if you consider the fact how many books he wrote, it turns out that all his life he had only to write books and do nothing more. But actually, he also did frustrations. During his life, Tsunkapa made a million, and don't you remember how many thousands of frustrations? Yes, probably a few million. Three million? Yes, three million. Three million. So during his life, he made three million frustrations. Can't you imagine what it is? Can't you? It's something like about 1,000 frustrations a day for 40 or 50 years. So he did a lot of frustrations. And the number of lectures he read for the students is also incredible. And it turns out that if he only did frustrations, he would spend all his life only doing frustrations. If he lectured, he would spend all his life just for preaching all these lectures. And in fact, it turned out that he just one man did it all for his life. But of course, when he awoke, he understood his mission. It's always very difficult. The identity of the person doesn't agree with the fact how he should move. Usually a person or a practitioner who is awakening or coming to enlightenment has certain withdrawals. Probably it wasn't easy for him, but in the end he became a master. In the debates he began to show such things that made many people shocked for the first time. Many Buddhists or religious people are conservatives by their nature. Do you understand the word conservatism? It means that people adhere to certain dogmas and refuse these dogmas with great difficulty. That is, they adhere to certain concepts. And Tsankaba had to break a lot of these concepts, a lot of them. And here, where we are sitting now, a monastery was built when Tsankaba was already over 50 years old. He already began to seek during his trips, and the disciples offered him, Lama, you travel and travel, let us build a monastery for you. Then he had numerous popularity, but he didn't have his own place, so he was an ascetic. And then this monastery was built. I don't remember, but I think it took almost a year, so great resources were spent to make a place for Tsankapa. And the place was chosen perfectly. So to say it wasn't an accident, yes, Tsankapa chose it, but he chose it for the reason that took place 2600 years ago. Now I'll tell you about this reason. When Shakyamuni Buddha lived, there was a reincarnation of Tsunkapa, so he, the future Tsunkapa, was born and lived in the same time as Shakyamuni Buddha. But he was very small and couldn't do any selfless activities. Then the Buddha was walking with his disciples, and Tsunkapa decided, oh, Tsunkapa, this boy decided to give him his rosary. The Buddha leaned over to Tsunkapa so that he could put his rosary into his bowl. The rosary, of course, held no value, but nevertheless, then the Buddha predicted that this boy in the future will revive the dharma which will go into decline by that time. And before the boy saw the Buddha, one Naga had come to the Buddha and gave him one precious conch shell, very expensive and precious, and the Buddha was about to give it to this boy, but the boy wouldn't be able to use such a precious shell and probably he would have big problems with others because of this precious conch shell. Well, is the logic clear? That is, he would be given two precious things. Then the Buddha gave this conch shell to Mongolian and said, Mongolian, fly to Tibet and bury this conch shell in a certain place so that this boy would find it after almost 2000 years. And Mongoliana barred the conch shell on this mountain from the other side, not from this one, but from the other side. And Tsunkapa, when the monastery was already built, found the conch shell. This conch shell is stored in Ripung now, I think, yes. Now it is kept in Ripung and on some holidays it is shown. So there was a prediction that Mongoliana came here buried this coin shell, then Sankapa found it. And due to the fact that Sankapa could bring Buddhism to a new level, that is, to bring to it essence to the spirit of self-development, because there is such a point of view that by that time, 
Buddhism had been mined in rituals. What was the problem in Buddhism in Tibet? There was the Bon region which was very peculiar and self-centered. And when Buddhism began to spread, the fusion took place and certain rituals of Bon complemented Buddhism. Yes, probably nobody wanted it to happen, but it happened in the end. They were mighty in these rituals. I'll even tell you a story which may be unpleasant, but one existing Lama told the following story. He says, I am alive now, almost due to the miracle. When he was little, he was recognized as the reincarnation of one Lama, so he was said, you were that one and uh, lived there. And this guy with three same guys were invited to some not very famous monastery. They were fed, given presents, they lived almost in rural conditions. But they couldn't understand what was going on. And uh, this guy wasn't a fool, and uh, it was clear that he could have a good fate. Then one of the lamas told him secretly, run, run from here as quickly as possible, because they will kill you. It turned out they wanted to build a new and large monastery, and uh, for that they would trapeze, not trapeze. In short, they wanted to do the following retail, to excavate four pits in four corners of the monastery, and to kill four guys in order that these reincarnations would become the spirits they protect us of four directions. Think about it, it was practiced by Buddhists. What do you think? If you have ever read the Buddhist teachings, can you imagine what nonsense it is? But they did it ostensibly in order to spread the Dharma of the Buddha, eating meat and doing a lot of other things. And the guy survived because he was taught. He was simply saved. So he ran away and then he became the Lama and says that such things are practiced. Unfortunately, because the bone was introduced in Buddhism to my great regret. In general, there were a lot of strange things here and Sankapa returned the certain essence of the Buddhist te teachings. The closest disciples of Sankapa, or rather one of them, became the first Dalai Lama. So, the tradition of Dalai Lama studies with the disciples of Sankapa. Although probably I tell you a seditious thing, but there is a point of view that Sankapa didn't recommend searching for reincarnations of Bodhisattvas at all. He said to choose the best person among those who is in the monastery now, to serve as the abbot of the monastery. And uh, do you know how does Buddhism begin to develop? Firstly, they began to search for the Dalai Lamas, then the Karmapas. And what is the Dalai Lama and the Karmapa? What is the idea? Some soul reincarnates, lives all the life, pulling some followers after him, then dies, and they look for him again in order to make him do the same things again. Do you realize how selfish these people who want to get it all from him again should be? Did they think about what the man who pulls it all feel? Maybe you don't understand what I'm talking about, or rather, you can't understand the depths of this drama. Probably only modern yoga teachers who will devote all their life to this path will realize how it's difficult, because the followers are a huge problem. And to be honest, when I look at the Dalai Lama, I really feel sorry about how it is difficult to him. Because those selfish people who constantly go to him. Have you ever seen how people usually meet the Dalai Lama? Well, probably never. This is something like circus, so everybody is ready to stick all over him, to get some energy from him. Actually, no one thinks about what he is experiencing because of this. All of them just want to get. This is, to my great regret, so great egocentrism, so great selfishness in relation to the person is just a nightmare. And Sankapa was the one who was an opponent of this system of searching for the abbot searching for the leader of these or those monasteries. But Tibetans have their own head on their shoulders, 
they went the other way. Understand, in any way, I don't want to diminish the dignity of the Dalai Lama, who pulls a very high burden now. I'm just talking about the whole institution. You see, unfortunately, it's a very big problem because really there is such a point of view that the present Dalai Lama is the last. And he said that most likely this path will finish on me. Is it the same? So I can't comment on this question because maybe it's the same. So maybe not. It's difficult to say. The fact is that this procedure is the same thing they might in dogmatism. Now I'll tell you how, for example, last Kamapa did the transmission. I mean the Kamapa who lives in India, not that one who lives in China, but in India. So, there is the Kamapa. Before coming up to him, there are two or three bodyguards. They completely search the recipient. So, in fact, the bodyguards transmit the initiation. They completely search him. So, before you and Shop come up to the Kamapa, you have already fingered completely. Kamapa puts a flag on you, snaps your head. That's it. So, you are ready. You've got the initiation of the bodyguards. It is a reality, unfortunately. Now the Dalai Lama is sick, therefore they have to feed the Dalai Lama with meat. Why? Because the doctors of the Dalai Lama said, the Dalai Lama, you need to eat meat. You will be just healthier. The doctors decided, so he began to eat meat for some time. Don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing it in any way. I tell you this only so that you understand that there is the Buddhist teachings and there is something what is now preserved in Tibet. It's not even different things. We can say that they are moving in opposite directions. Yes, they use the techniques, and as for the content, I can tell you the same thing. Its story is surely curious. When it was built and when it grew at the beginning, there were eight and then even sixteen, how to say, no monasteries, but sixteen branches, teachings, which gave different knowledge of different lamas. For example, there is a lama, he writes the notes on the subject to which the Buddha spoke about. And the next generations of disciples are studying on the basis of the notes of this specific lama. In other branch, the other lama understood the Buddha's teachings in his own way, and the disciples of this lama or this monastery are studying on the basis of his writings. This is not a joke, it's for real. It's well known, it's a fact that this happened in such a way. Then, in some cases they merged, in some cases disagreed again. All this is great and wonderful. What am I doing all the talking for? Friends, don't rely on the fact that a Lama will give you the sacred truth. Even that I lo I'm telling you is my personal opinion. The opinion of not enlightened being having achieved nothing. But the fact is that I'm just reading the scriptures, different scriptures for 20 years and roughly speaking, aggregate them. So, trying to understand. And when you read a lot of scriptures, at a certain stage they gradually, how to say, settled down and the mosaic formed. That nightmare which is derived from all of this leads to the things that I have to tell you about. You see what is after Russian. We read the same things and make different conclusions. Katya has woman's soft version, but I have unfortunately, yes, a harsh one, I'm sorry. But Katya is right in her own way. Of course, the Lamas have no selfishness. They pull very heavy burden, but unfortunately the burden is very heavy. In fact, I'll give you an example of the thing that Katya said is wonderful, but let's see what sutras specifically tell. In Sadharma Pundarika Sutra or Lotus Sutra, beginning from the second chapter, the Buddha predicts to his disciples that they inevitably will become Tathangadas, and he inevitably will give this place to them. So, you should understand, Tathangata always gives the place in order that his disciples could evolve. If a Lama constantly reincarnates and sits on the throne, what will those who will always help him do? They won't be able to gain their experience of the Lama. You see what the problem is. They won't evolve, because the experience of disciples and assistants is one experience, is great, marriage and so on, but in order to drain to the least, you have to become a leader, so to say, and to learn by experience what actually it is. Therefore, in this case, the version of Katya is correct and wonderful, but from my point of view, the Buddha talked about a little bit different things. Do you have any questions? If I understood correctly, there is no need to search for the reincarnations of Lama and in order to maintain and develop Buddhism, they should choose from those who are developing now in the monastery. Well, 
that is uh, let me rephrase that so they should choose from them whom to choose well not to look the reincarnations but to choose someone who is developing at the moment i'll respond to you a little bit differently so you should find this knowledge, knowledge within yourself any lama or any reincarnation can give you some hints you can read the scriptures but you should find the essence within yourself why because if you practice buddhism it means you practiced it in the past a hundred percent to be born in kali yuga in samsara when you have technological progress and to be interested in buddhism can never be random so so if you hadn't chosen the niche of a manager who makes money and goes on vacation to some resorts, but you are still interested in Buddhism, it's a hundred percent you have a kind of connection with the Buddhist teachings. So this knowledge is within you. Any scripture can give you a hint you should uh, take it from the inside. And unfortunately, watching what all the teachers say, I see each of them says a little bit uh, on his own version. It's exactly the same. You see, Katya told you about one version. I tell you about the other one, but each of us will decide independently who is right. But the fact is that I tell you this to make you begin to think about this problem and maybe in the end you will choose your own path in the connection to this problem. In this case, probably I break some authoritative opinions only to make you start moving on the path on your own. There will be no development without it. If you hold onto the hem of a teacher all your life, at the first stage you can get benefit. The teacher is necessary at a certain stage, but then probably he will be a stupor for you. If you listen to what the teacher says, all your life you won't evolve. That's the problem. Andrei, is it said in Sutras what if you have achieved the state of Buddha? What is the essence of the game? There is no information. Actually, when the Buddha was asked about Nirvana, he said, you shouldn't ask me this question. Why? Judging by the way the sutras describe the Buddha's dialogues with his disciples, for example, the Buddha tells Nanda in which reincarnation with which Buddha Ananda reached different levels. He saw all the same things. This is the reality which has already been formed. And we are here in the theater of Absat trying to get into the reality which the Hangalas have already formed. Do you understand the logic? As if he is above time and space. Yes, he becomes above time and space. You formulated it correctly. Do you understand the logic? So, we won't understand it. We won't understand. It's impossible. We can understand only a part of it with our mind. You see, you have a vision for a certain percentage. You don't see what is behind your back, and they see in the 360 degrees. So, if you try to describe the 360 degrees with your vision, you describe only a small part, but this is not a complete description. Anyway, in the Sutra, the Buddha says that he will return anyway, so after he reaches the state of Tathangata, he constantly returns. There is a chance, most likely. I don't want to believe it because it's very dramatic, but in order to come again, he starts everything absolutely from nothing. Because in the Lagos Sutra, it is said that even if you have built the stupa from sand, it means that in your past life you were Buddha. It's said a hundred percent. So, you couldn't do anything for the Buddha if in your past life you haven't been in a Buddha. It's impossible to understand these words if you don't understand that probably the Buddha absolutely achieving the realization leaves everything goes to zero and starts from nothing again. So, there are constantly a rise and then a complete fall. Then he climbs, climbs from nothing again, perhaps. Although I don't want to believe it. What? Does he start his path from nothing? Yes, consciously, yes. But they have... How is it better to explain it to you? They have good karma. In whatever body he gets due to his good merits, he will be able to rise again anyway like a phonics from the ashes. So, they are not afraid of reincarnation. When he reincarnates, he just knows that good karma will help, roughly speaking. But, of course, again, this is one of the versions. Because if it is so, it's so painful, it's uh, just a nightmare and a horror. Do they have to generate the experience of the modern world to give the teachings in the modern language? Yes, now there are a lot of people who in their past lives had great achievements, but having lost everything, they are trying in modern language to give people something they can understand. For example, there is one devotee. I respect this guy, although I don't share his methods. Do you know Lama Ole? 
I respect him because the audience that he leads is almost all meat eaters. There are 90% of people who are meat eaters for whom it's absolutely normal to drink alcohol, it's absolutely normal to smoke. If a person drinks alcohol and eats meat, his energy level will always be specific. Unfortunately, I have to send pleasant things. When there is a certain audience, the total energy has an influence on what you understand. Even if an enlightened lama comes, but the audience is average, this super enlightened lama will give them absolutely primitive things. But once again, I respect this guy very much. Because of these things he is doing, I can't imagine how much he suffers from them. But, for example, there is a prediction about the future Buddha Maitreya. In fact, he still accumulates the potential and according to some versions, about 5 billion years will pass according to human chronology. And now he is building his team in the world to Shita. So, they accumulate, roughly speaking, the energy in order to reincarnate in the human world. Therefore, we can't say that he starts from nothing. But probably when he reincarnates as the future Buddha Maitreya, According to the predictions, he will be a king, so he will be a prince and uh, then he will become a king. He will evolve and at a certain stage he will refuse his position and will become the Khangata. So, he will not start from nothing, right? But nevertheless, perhaps from the moment when he began to evolve up to the moment when he will become the Buddha Maitreya, the mind-boggling period of time will pass. But when he becomes the Buddha Maitre, he will have to live again. There is a very long period of preparation, but then it's necessary to start from nothing again. But once again, perhaps this is just a version.